moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message. Let all that I say, let all that I do, Lord, bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So if you were here last week, you'll remember I talked about the game of hide and seek and how the person who was it would often holler, right? ready or not, here I come. <coughs> and we liken that to Jesus and knowing when will he return. We don't know. We do not know, but he tells us to be ready. Ready because ready or not, he will come in his perfect time. Amen? And as I mentioned, today is Christ the King Sunday. Pope Pius XI instituted the Feast of Christ the King in 1925 to remind Christians that their allegiance was to their spiritual ruler in heaven as opposed to earthly supremacy, which was claimed by Benito Mussolini. The Anglican churches, meaning the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, and yes, we Methodists, join in adding this day to our lectionary. Not back in 1925, it wasn't even in the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, but finally by 1979, we got it there. And believe it or not, 1979 is our most common edition of the Book of Common Prayer. The real point to this is to a king, a king whose kingdom there shall be no end. King. What does it mean to be the king? Now here I go again, going back to my childhood, but I used to play a game. <laughs> it's funny that this happened two weeks in a row. But who played, <clears throat> who played the game King of the Hill when you were young? Oh, come on, you had to play, okay. <clears throat> come on, that old. <clears throat> right, you, you'd all be outside because remember as kids, we were always outside. Um, so you, you found a hill, a log, or something to stand on and put you taller than everybody else. And the kid first on the top would say, I'm King of the Hill, right? And you'd scream it, you were so positive, you had so much energy. And the rest of us would then, you know, come, come charging and we'd push and pull and, and tackle and, you know, do whatever we had to to remove that person from the king so that what could happen? We could stand up and say, I'm king of the world, as happy as we could be. Each time we tried to take down the person at the top of the hill was in a way a, um, a challenge because it, we, it was a demand for proof. Because if you're really king of the hill, you've got to defend yourself. You've got to stand up there. You've got to show us your power. Show us how strong you are. Save yourself and your kingdom when you're king of the hill. Because if you don't, I'm taking it away from you. Was the game. Each one of us wanted to get to the top of that dirt pile and yell, I'm king of the hill. Yes, my mother would have preferred that I was in the house playing Barbies, but I was outside playing King of the Hill <laughs> and getting filthy. But it was a great game as a kid. You interacted with each other. You had a ton of fun. But you see, in retrospect, there's a small problem. You see, kids grow up and many have never stopped playing that game. Sometimes, some became adults and that game became their way of life. Our dirt piles, as we, as we played on, can be substituted as adults for success, money, and power, and control, reputation, and popularity. For some, the dirt piles, their kingdoms, they become your family, your children, or the fairy tale of living happily ever after. Others claim the kingdom of just being right, and being holy. Often our dirt piles became ways of thinking in political parties and social groups. Our nation and even our church could become king of the hill playgrounds for some. All where we think we have to be on top and or in control. There are all sorts of kingdoms, 
Each one of us has our own personal dirt pile in our life that we want to be in control of or on top of. The adult version of King of the Hill is about filling our emptiness, fighting our fear, and ultimately establishing some type of order and control of our lives. What began as a child's game and having fun has become the reality for many lives. For many of us, life is a constant scramble, right? We're scrambling to establish and maintain our own little kingdoms to convince ourselves as much as everyone else that we're okay, that we are enough, that we are king or queen of our domain. You know what? That's a hard way to live. Today, Christ the King Sunday celebrates and reminds us that playing king of the hill does not have to be the final reality of our life. Life can and should be different. We do not have to spend our lives trying to get to the top of anything, any perceived kingdom that we come up with. We do not need to spend our lives trying to keep our balance on top of a lifeless log or rock or whatever kingdom you are defending. Christ the King invites us to stop playing that game. Life does not have to be, never was intended to be, an ongoing game of King of the Hill. If we choose to stop playing the game, it means that we must give up our little kingdom. We cannot celebrate Christ as king <coughs> as we continue to fight our way to be on top. We can have one or the other, but we cannot have both. Today we will again pray when we say the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. But guess what? It rolls off of our tongue so easily because we have it memorized for years but do we think about those words? But I wonder if we really know what we're asking for, and do we really mean it, or are we just mimicking a prayer we were taught? Implicit in that prayer is the request for his kingdom to come. But you know what, if his kingdom has to come, then guess what, ours has to go. You can't have both. It's one thing to pray for God's kingdom to come. It's another to let go of ours. After all, we've been trying to be king of our own little hills for so long. Or at least we've convinced ourselves that we're king of our own hills. It's not easy to let go of our perceived control. And perhaps a big part of that is our stubbornness. And more often than not, I think we try to negotiate with God. All right, God, if you can prove to me that you're king, if you can prove yourself to me, show me your evidence, make it, make it be, and then I'll let go of my perceived kingdom. But isn't it funny, when we have that thought, what we want God to show us is that our way is the right way. And once he agrees with us, then we agree to let him be king, as opposed to listening to his way. When Jesus hung on that cross, the leaders, the soldiers, and one of the criminals, they all wanted the same thing. <coughs> they wanted to see proof that Christ was king. They want to see evidence of his kingdom. We would all like to see that. After all, if Jesus really is the king, the one to rule our lives, and we know we believe that, does he really need to prove it to us? Save yourself if you are the Messiah of God. Save yourself if you are the King of Jews. Aren't you the Messiah? Why won't you prove it? Save yourself, save me. That's the plea we hear. At one level, I think we can see Jesus come down from that cross. We want to see his wounds disappear. We become teary to this day, even if I think about the movie Passion of the Christ. I, the tears still just come to my mind. We want to see a well-dressed king with physical strength and military might. 
military and political power. We want to see something spectacular, something so beyond our reality of our ordinary life. Yet at a much deeper level, however these demands are about more than just Jesus saving himself from death and physical pain, from political defeat. At a deeper level, we are crying, crying out to him, save yourself and us. Save us from our unbelief. Save yourself and us from our need to control. Save yourself and us from our feels, our fear that these little dirt piles that we claim as our kingdom are more important to us than he is. Show us proof, Lord. But guess what? He's not going to do it. He will not. At least not in the way that we most likely want him to. Jesus will not offer us proof of his kingship. Instead, he offers us his kingdom. He invites us to share in his kingship. That happens in the silence of deep love. The leaders are scoffing at Jesus. He responds with silence. The soldiers are mocking him. He responds with silence. One of the criminals ridicules him. He responds in silence. What kind of king would you be at that moment? Would you be silent? Or would you have the need to defend yourself? Think for a moment, perhaps of an argument or a disagreement that you've had recently. In retrospect, how could you have handled it differently? Could you have been more loving? Did you really need to prove yourself right? In your opinion, right, mind you. And if that agreement or argument got heated and lasted more than a moment, did you say hurtful things that, believe me, once they come out of your mouth, they never, ever can get taken back? Oh, you can apologize, but the words you speak in haste, in anger, are never forgotten. You see, everyone is demanding proof of Jesus, and none are getting what they ask for. Jesus does not take himself or the criminals off the cross, does he? He doesn't answer the leaders. He refuses to respond to the soldiers. He is silent. In that silence, the other criminal finally begins to get it. He understands. <clears throat> it's not about getting proof of Christ's kingship. It's about letting go of our own kingship. It's about coming down from our little piles, our little hills, and realizing that we already are and always have been loyal members of God's holy kingdom. That this realization underlies the criminal's cry. Jesus, remember me. Remember me not because of what I have done or left undone. But remember, in spite of those things, remember me not because of who I am, but of who you are. His cry to be remembered is the cry of one who has emptied himself of everything. He's let go. He's let go of every last kingdom that he wants control of, he wants to be on top of. You see, this is the reign of Christ. The reign of Christ does not mean we now have all the answers, that everything is fixed, that there is no more pain, or that every problem has been eliminated. Jesus will not take us off the crosses. Instead, he gets up there with us. He does not fix our lives. Instead, he enters into the reality of our ordinary existence. We are remembered right there in the reality that our everyday life, in the midst of whatever pain we may have, in the midst of our dying, in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our guilt, that Christ the King says to us, Truly I tell you, today 
you will be with me in paradise. The Gospels are full of parables about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like, they all start, the kingdom of God is like the mustard seed, so small but yet grows so big. The kingdom of God is like the merchant who gives up everything for the pearl of great price. The kingdom of God is like the father who embraces his prodigal son. There are so many wonderful parables about what the kingdom of God is truly like. For one woman that I want to tell you about, it looked like paying attention to people who were standing in long lines for bread during the Great Depression and recognizing them in them the face of Christ. She saw Christ there, hungry, standing weary and worn out on a Manhattan sidewalk and knew she had to do something about it. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. This woman, whose name is Dorothy Day, didn't just give a donation of food to a soup kitchen and go about her life. She started a ministry. She devoted her whole life to both caring for the poor and trying to end systemic injustices that creates poverty in the first place. She founded the Catholic Workers' Movement, along with its houses of hospitality, its farm communities, its newspaper, its retreat centers. She was a tireless activist and writer, as well as a committed anarchist who, who spoke out against capitalism and against socialism. In other words, she was one of the leading radicals of her time, a person who put no stop in the powers to be of the world. She did so much. She worked tirelessly to enact and embody what are called corporal works of mercy, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, <clears throat> to ransom the captive, to shelter the homeless and visit with the sick, and to bury the dead. These that were in such a need were her main focus. But yet, as the writer D.L. Mayfield notes, when you read her autobiography, these good works and towering achievements in her life aren't <coughs> Instead, she writes about the passion beneath her passion, the passion of upending wellspring, of motivation that kept her going through hardships and disappointments. The passion, the motivation was love. She loved Jesus. And through Jesus, she loved others. And loving Jesus, she was quite clear, meant serving, following, and obeying him. It was love for obedience to Jesus, not a political philosophy that made her truly radical in every sense of the word. She didn't need to be king of anything, of any kingdom. She wanted to serve her king. She went to church a lot. She had a disciplined prayer life. She was devoted to not only the corporal works of mercy, but to the spiritual ones as well. These are her own words. She wanted to admonish the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive all injuries, and to pray for the living and the dead, just like Jesus Christ the king of kings. That, that is the king we are called to follow. That is the king we are called to obey. A king who is not interested in power, but in weakness, who lives and works amongst all peoples, enduring every pain and hardship that they endure. A king who treats his subjects with the tender compassion of a shepherd caring for his lost or injured lamb. A king who healed body and soul, attending always to both spiritual and physical needs while courageously calling out the structures of power that made injustice and poverty and oppression look like just the way the world was supposed to be. This king still calls us to a better way, into greener pastures, 
into a place of salvation and healing, into becoming a beloved community. Are we able to hear that call? Are we able to set aside our pride and our achievements and kneel at his feet? No one said it would be easy. It will make us look foolish, perhaps, at some times to some people. Perhaps it could be dangerous where you are. But the paradox of our faith is that the more we bind ourselves to obedience to God, the more we will experience true, real freedom, including freedom from all powers and principalities of the world that are always working so hard to bind us to them instead of to Jesus. We always say Satan works really hard to have his way in us. We need to make sure Christ's word is working even harder. You see, but we don't need to be Dorothy Day. We don't need to try and be Mother Teresa. We just need to be ourselves, our best selves. We don't need to be king of any perceived hill that we have created. We don't need, believe it or not, to always be right. We don't need to be stubborn and so set in our ways that we become prideful. We don't need to hold grudges, and we do not need to be in charge. What we really need is to be the selves that God called into creation and loves with abandon. We need to let Jesus be king over all of our life over the words that we speak, the actions that we take. We need to let Jesus be king of every ounce of who we are. What kind of king will you be going forward? King of your own decisions? Or will you serve the one and only true king, Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. Take a moment and pray with me, please. The prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago, and really mean the words as you say them. Just don't, you know, say them off the top of your head. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing song is Love Lifted Me. If you're comfortable and able, please rise. The word